want to come up with Jersey? Okay. Come say hi to everybody. Alrighty, so, um, we have finished our second exam yesterday. Hopefully it was not too bad. Uh, again, I was trying to, uh, kind of take multiple bits of various homework assignments and kind of combine them together in new ways. Uh, or in some cases they were pretty much the same thing, but with different molecules or, or compounds. And so hopefully nothing was too, too crazy there. Uh, it turns out that the, uh, you know, problem from hell this time was uh, the titration one. Oh my gosh, what a lot of work that was. So we'll see uh, kind of uh, as I grade it, you know, how people are, um, what people chose to do and all that. So uh, we'll have that uh, data available. I'll, again, I'll try and have them kind of graded within about a week or so. Um, we'll see how far I can get with that. Uh, and so uh, we'll have that uh, data. Yeah, I figured most people would skip the titration one. So just because it's five different calculations you have to do, except the uh, half equivalence point, that one's the easy one. So uh, we'll see. So um, we'll be good. So um, <laughs> this is really, she's sitting in such a strange position. She's just like chilling on me with her butt in the air. <laughs> Oh, crazy, Miss Jersey. Okay. Uh, such a sweetie. Alrighty, so let's, uh, we're going to move on now to chapter 19, which is on uh, thermodynamics. Um, and so uh, this is going to basically answer the following questions is, under what conditions will reactions happen and to what extent uh, they will uh, proceed. Uh, and so that kind of, at least that second one kind of deals with the concept of equilibrium, right? Where we would see that eventually we would reach some particular state in which we would have a constant ratio of products to reactants, right? That's what an equilibrium constant told us. But uh, so far we haven't discussed, you know, why do certain things need to be certain temperatures in order to happen? You know, why is it that uh, the formation of nitrogen uh, monoxide or nitric oxide uh, will happen in a car engine but not happen just in ambient temperatures? Uh, why, you know, <laughs> why does ice melt at zero degrees? You know, it's, uh, you know, kind of understanding thermodynamics will answer these questions. It will sh at least allow us to uh, have mathematical explanations for uh, figuring out these things. And we're going to see we're actually going to be able to figure out um, equilibrium constants using uh, these ideas. Uh, once we can figure out uh, two measures, uh, one of which will be enthalpy and another one we'll learn later today. So uh, it'll be exciting. We'll finally kind of get to figure out how to come up with Ks on our own. Alrighty, so uh, before we get started on that, was there uh, any kind of question or anything uh, related to the exam or, I don't know, the class or something uh, before we get get uh, down and dirty with thermodynamics. I did put uh, the rest of your lab sims up for the rest of the semester, so uh, you can kind of deal with those. You'll see the, the due dates for those. Um, so there's kind of basically one due each week uh, until kind of, I don't know, like two weeks before the end of the semester or so. I think that's the last one, so. Alrighty. Well, uh, if there's nothing left, uh, we can go ahead and start talking about thermodynamics. So as always, we're going to have vocabulary uh, as our first <laughs> kind of section for the new chapter, right? So we're going to see uh, first about spontaneity. And that is basically, does a reaction happen?
uh, at given conditions. And we're going to see that um, there's a lot of kind of boo -boo 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 common examples of this. Uh, perhaps the most common one I've seen, I don't know why I'm drawing a graph, it should not be a graph, but here we go. Here's a mountain. Here's a boulder that is just over the edge. And so... Will this boulder roll down to the bottom of the mountain? Yes, it will spontaneously. That is to say, we don't have to give it any extra kind of impetus to happen. It's just going to happen by itself. If we have a boulder at the top of the mountain, uh, assuming it is overcoming friction, this will spontaneously uh, descend or roll down the mountain. It's going to just tumble, 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 down it goes. All right, however, what about the reverse process? Oops. Can we take this boulder at the bottom of the hill, and will it just by itself roll back up? That would be very strange if it did, right? Uh, we know that this is not going to happen. This would be not non-spontaneous. The, the rock will not climb the mountain. Right? Exactly. We would need to give it work or some sort of energy uh, in order to get it up the mountain. So some kinetic energy or some work, uh, we would have to give it to get it back on the top there. Because this is a non-spontaneous process, it is not going to happen uh, by itself. All right, a spontaneous process will happen by itself. So that rock will roll down the mountain. It has the gravitational potential energy, and it will just tumble down uh, given the opportunity to do so. Uh, however, it's not going to roll back up the mountain by itself. So uh, spontaneous processes are just kind of, we're looking at if something is going to happen by itself. That's all we're looking at. We're not looking at how fast things are happening. We're not thinking about, uh, you know, to, you know, uh, that sort of thing. So speed has nothing to do with spontaneity. So uh, spontaneous things like this rock for going down the mountain can happen very quickly, right? The rock tumbles down, 10 seconds later it's at the bottom of the, of the hill. But something like uh, iron rusting is a process that's not kind of visible. We can't see it, you know, rust forming in real time. You know, we look out a week later and poof, the thing is covered in rust. You know, that's a spontaneous process too. So just rust forming. And so uh, it has nothing to do with the rate of reaction, but it does tell us if it will happen uh, by itself or not. Uh, it's not going to kind of reverse itself, right? The, the rust is not going to turn back into iron, uh, again, unless we uh, put some energy into it. So we can... Uh, so spontaneous things will happen by themselves. Non-spontaneous will not happen by themselves, but... By inputting energy, we can force non-spontaneous processes. And as Kevin has already mentioned, that heat, that energy can come in many different forms. So it could be work, it could be heat, uh, it could be any sort of uh, energy they're giving it, kinetic energy, just, you know, if something collides with it, it'll roll up the mountain, right? And technically that's work. But um, so by putting in some sort of energy, we can force a non-spontaneous process to happen. All right, and sometimes we have uh, kind of some processes 
that are spontaneous, but they need kind of just a little bit of a uh, push to get started. So that could be, for example, our rock is now kind of in a, a hole on the top of the mountain. And so if given the opportunity, it would very much like to roll down the mountain, right? But we have these very small little, uh, you know, barriers preventing it from doing so. And so sometimes we'll see that some reactions just need a spark to happen. So same thing with, with gasoline. We know gasoline has a lot of chemical energy held within its bonds. It would like to burn. It would like to become oxidized, release that energy. And we just kind of need to throw a match at it to get it to go. And after that, it will spontaneously continue itself. So it's self-sustaining. Um, and so this is kind of the same idea. We need some sort of just a little bit of energy to get it going. And so some reactions will kind of just be uh, spontaneous once uh, started. And so if you give it just that kind of one little bit of activation energy, as it were, uh, it can then carry itself forward the rest of the way. And so it's not necessarily spontaneous by itself in those given conditions, but it can be spontaneous uh, with just a little bit of help. Oh dear, the creature is awakened. Let's see what he's going to do. Alrighty, and so yes, if we give it a little bit of energy... If we give it this much energy, then it can spontaneously tumble the rest of the way down. We do not have to give it any more energy. It'll continue doing its own thing after that. Tumbling down the hill. And then, of course, we have the very loud plane outside. Uh, okay, so uh, that's kind of three classifications we have. And we're going to see that <coughs> spontaneous... Let me just write it down. I've said it a couple times, but... Spontaneity, rather, if a reaction will happen by itself or not, does not imply any information about kinetics. A spontaneous process does not tell us it's fast, does not tell us it's slow. It just will happen or it won't at the conditions that you're given. So just keep that in mind. All right. <clears throat> so um, we're going to take a look at certain other spontaneous processes. For example, if we have uh, a container, let's say, and it has gas particles in it on one side and it's got a vacuum here. If we open that uh, kind of barrier in the middle, if we open that, what's gonna happen? I mean, we already know, right? We're gonna end up dispersing our gas particles. And that's a spontaneous process too, right? We, we know that gases will always spontaneously fill their containers. And that's a spontaneous process. Gases always expand to spontaneously fill containers. So we're going to see why that's going to be uh, the case in a little bit. Uh, we know that. That's another spontaneous process. And we're going to see just the likelihood of all of those distributed gas particles as happening to be on one side, as in the original state on the left, not going to happen. That's going to be non-spontaneous, right? We can't just f somehow force all of those gas molecules to go back on the left, uh, you know, again, without putting some crazy amount of energy into this uh, process. So we would have to, you know, maybe 
put the barrier in, suck out all the molecules, and then force them in the other side or something. You know, it'd be a lot of work. You know, not going to happen by itself. And we'll see why that is. Creature is panting. You can jump off the couch, you know, dude. You don't have to stay up there. So that's another spontaneous process. And so a gas kind of deciding to condense itself back to one side is non-spontaneous. Not going to happen. Another example is uh, certain uh, state changes. So we know that at zero degrees Celsius, ice is in equilibrium with water, right? Or I guess more formally, uh, we have that process happening, right? Of course, we know that the process of ice turning into water is endothermic, right? Which means, of course, that we need to put energy in to make it happen, right? And so, if that's going to happen, it's going to absorb energy from the environment, right? The system. The system will absorb energy from the surroundings. But we also know that this is also a spontaneous process. At zero degrees Celsius. We know it is non-spontaneous. At temperatures below zero degrees. Right? If you are at negative one degrees, your ice is never going to melt unless you add some other energy to it, right? So uh, we're gonna see that there's another factor here that's gonna kind of make that deciding uh, component between these two. And so uh, that's gonna be what's called the entropy of the system. Entropy, which is denoted by the letter S. Uh, we're going to see that that is the reason ice will melt spontaneously uh, in spite of some process being endothermic. And we'll describe what entropy is in a little bit, but I want to talk about uh, one more kind of thing first. And that's the idea of reversible and irreversible properties. And so, um, or not properties, processes rather. So when we've talked about um, reversible reactions, you know, we, we talk about them as, in terms of an equilibrium, you know, things are going forward, things are going backwards. But if we were to be really, really careful about our wording and our definitions of these processes, we're going to see that uh, in order for something to be truly reversible, in order for a process or reaction to be truly reversible, We can have no, or delta E must be zero. For us. So you can't have ener any energy change between the two. And so that means for something to truly be reversible, let's think about a, a reaction. Let's talk about, uh, I don't know, we know we had that... Uh, our favorite gas reaction, right, was the Haber process, right? So yes, this is technically a reversible reaction, but we're going to see it is not a reversible process 
in terms of like the most narrow uh, of terms. So we're going to have to say that the change in energy from the uh, nitrogen and hydrogen into ammonia must be zero. And in that way, it can go back and forth without any input of energy. If, en if the change in energy is zero between both states, the reactants and the products, then it's truly reversible. But we know this process is significantly endothermic, right? We have to put in a lot of heat, it's usually what, 500 degrees or so, plus a catalyst to get this thing to happen. Uh, and so, unfortunately, you know, in real life, we're going to see this. this is technically, by a, a more strict definition, an irreversible process. However, an irreversible process can be reversed with energy uh, or some sort of energy change uh, going on with it. So whether that's a decrease or increase in energy, uh, that's uh, going to be kind of the deciding factor. And so let's take a look at this uh, in more detail. We're going to see in reality pretty much all processes are irreversible. Meaning some, meaning delta E is not zero. So either uh, something is going to happen where you have to put in energy or get out energy uh, as a result of, of uh, a process. All right, and so in reality, we're going to see that uh, everything is going to be irreversible. However, if we wanted to pretend, so, I mean, another example is we know that uh, heat always goes from hot to cold, right? Uh, if you put something hot into something cold, the heat will move from the hot thing into the cold thing uh, until they've reached some sort of equilibrium, right? That's a spontaneous process. Um, but it's irreversible, right? If you dump, you know, a pot of hot or a, a hot pan into cold water, which I wouldn't suggest, you'll probably warp your pan. But if you do that, the heat is not going to all of a sudden go back into the pan and have cold water at the end, right? It's a spontaneous process. Um, and it's irreversible. It's not going to happen, you know, without putting some crazy amount of energy in there. Uh, there is definitely an energy change there. We've lost some energy to the surroundings uh, as heat. So, uh, but if we pretend that we have, say, a pan, here it is, at 20.0000001 degrees Celsius, and our bucket of water at 20.0000000000 degrees Celsius, Technically, there will be a heat transfer, yes? From the pan to the water, if we put these two together. But since that temperature, that amount of heat is so small, it's very hard for us to quantify, okay, is that heat currently in the system or the surroundings? And even so, you know, if we just have one joule of energy or something, or a microjoule of heat, you know, it's very hard for us to say, okay, that, that one extra joule of heat or microjoule or whatever is currently in the water or it's currently in the pan is really not something we can identify. And so we see if we have an infinitesimal change, in that case, we can consider it to be reversible. Whereas that heat could be moving back and forth in between those. And since it's so small, we really don't even notice it. And so there's it's not really a way for us to distinguish where it is at a given time because it's constantly going back and forth. And so in that case, when we have infinitesimal change, infinitesimal change. In this case, it was a, a temperature change. We're going to see that a process K 
can be considered reversible. All right, and so we kind of fake it. So, I mean, really, there's no way for us to get this pan to that temperature and have the water at exactly, you know, one millionth of a degree less, right? It'd be just completely absurd. Uh, you know, the energy would be completely lost to the surroundings immediately, right? As soon as it's in the air, off it goes. Uh, or some energy from the air is going to go in the water. It's unrealistic, right? Um, but it allows us to do something. So let's go back to that entropy idea. So entropy, again, S. We're going to talk about it in detail today. Uh, it's going to be an important kind of new concept that we talk about in, uh, in thermodynamics. But suffice it to say, at the most basic level, it is a measure of disorder or chaos. So kind of or randomness. And uh, we're going to see how we can uh, relate this to these processes. We're going to see that S for a process, the entropy associated with a process, uh, is relatable to the heat that would happen in a reversible process at a given temperature. All right, so again, irreversible processes don't exist in reality. But if we pretend that we have an infinitesimal change, we're going to see that, for example, for ice melting, we have a given uh, heat change with that, right? We know that at uh, constant uh, pressure, uh, Q was equal to delta H, right? Uh, for a given quantity, right? Delta H per whatever, mole, gram, who cares? Uh, and so in this case, that was delta H fusion. And so we're going to see, oh, I'm sorry, this should be delta S, the change in entropy we're going to see that we can approximate this uh, if we just assume any temperature change to be infinitesimal. We can approximate the entropy of a process by being its delta H over a given temperature. And so we can calculate it. So for, for water, for water is what, 6.5? A one kilojoules per mole. The temperature at which this process happens is zero degrees or 273 Kelvin. We're going to see, of course, because we have temperature in the denominator, we cannot ever use Celsius because uh, we can't ever divide by zero, right? And so we can see the change in entropy associated with this process would just be 6.01 kilojoules per mole over 273 Kelvin. We can calculate it. Uh, I have it somewhere here. Uh, it's going to be, uh, where did I put it? Ah, but we also need, uh, well, this is technically uh, per mole, right? We're going to need to get rid of that because we want uh, kilojoules per Kelvin as our answer. So, oh my gosh, Miss Jersey, get over here. Uh, one mole, of course. I guess we have to keep the mole here. You're so sweet. Uh, because we know this is going to be happening in every single uh, particle or molecule of ice going into water, right? So uh, this is per mole. We can keep it per mole if we want, but typically we're, we refer to uh, delta S in units of energy per temperature. 
So uh, let's go ahead and get rid of that moles business here uh, by putting uh, our, let's just put one mole in here. Let's just get rid of uh, that. Well, so we can see what it's gonna be for one mole of uh, ice happening here. All right, so uh, if we go ahead and do that, we can figure out what this is going to be. Uh, technically, actually, I think we should put that mole in terms of, uh, let's put that in terms of uh, particles. If we do this, what are we going to get as our answer? Kevin, if you'd be so kind. Actually, let's, why am I calculating in terms of molecules? Forget it, let's do moles, it's easier. I'm just crazy. I don't want to do this. Let's keep it as moles. Kevin, what's the answer? Uh, I think it's going to be 0.02. Or 0.03, maybe. I don't want to calculate this, Kevin. Six point, thank you. Okay, it is 0 0.22. 0 0.022 uh, kilojoules per Kelvin, right? The moles will cancel out. Aha, Star-Lord beat you today. So we're just gonna use moles. Yeah, let's get rid of the, the thing. We don't need the, the 6.022. All right, uh, and so uh, that would be the change in entropy associated with this process. Or if we wanted, we could put it in 22 uh, joules per Kelvin as well. That would work. Notice that this is a positive quantity. And that means that the entropy is increasing uh, over through, through this process. And in looking at that, that tells us that things are getting uh, more disorderly as they go through. And hopefully that makes sense, right? Because we have ice, which is in its nice kind of crystalline shape, turning into water molecules swishing about each other, right? We're gonna see this is always gonna be the process for uh, a fusion or a vaporization. But that, the disorder, or the entropy here, is the driving force. Uh, behind this process being spontaneous. All right, even though it's endothermic, you, in fact, I think we talked about this when we talked about solutions, right? We saw that sometimes delta H for uh, mixing a solution uh, could be positive, meaning you have an endothermic solution formation, but we saw that it can still happen, right? And that's because of entropy. So we're gonna see again that the entropy is gonna be the driving force behind a lot of the processes uh, that we see here. And so uh, we're going to be working with entropy the, the whole time uh, as we go through this sort of uh, idea. All right, and so of course, the change in entropy would be the same as uh, the final minus the initial. So of course, if it's positive, that means you have more disorder uh, at the end than you did at the start. And that is always favorable uh, in terms of the universe, right? Go away, phone. Yeah. Alrighty. Any questions on this problem that we did? Or just kind of how to calculate uh, S?
<laughs> All right. So we know that Delta S will be positive for a few things. We can uh, kind of already say uh, what it's going to be positive for. We have a number of conditions where entropy will always be positive. And that will be this process here. So going from a solid to a liquid or a liquid to gas will always be positive. If you want to think about that conceptually, we're going from more orderly to more disordered, right? Gases are the most chaotic uh, of our states of matter, whereas solids are typically nice and organized uh, and things don't move very much. And so uh, it's going to be always positive when you're going through phase changes in this direction. And notice these phase changes are always endothermic as well. That just happens to be coincidence, but doesn't matter. The delta S is positive. That's why these things are going to happen. An endothermic process will never happen uh, if you have a negative delta S. So uh, we'll see that. That will be something we'll deal with later when we talk about Gibbs free energy. But anyways, uh, another one is uh, a solid going to a solution is always going to be entropically favorable, positive entropy. And then we also have, I guess I should use correct grammar, fewer gas molecules. Two more gas molecules. So reactions that have a larger stoichiometric coefficient in the product for gaseous reactions will also have a, del a positive delta S. And you can think about this again conceptually. So a solid being broken apart, if you think about sodium chloride, nicely organized sodiums and chlorides alternating. So that's, that's more of a... Um, so solubility is always entropically favorable. However, with insoluble solids, that's an enthalpy issue. It's their enthalpy of mixing that is too endothermic to be overcome by the uh, entropy here. And remember that the enthalpy of solution, it depends about solute-solute interactions and solute-solvent interactions. So if your solute-solute interactions are really strong, it's going to take a lot of energy to break this. It's going to be very endothermic uh, rather than the... So, um, you know, forming the bonds for sol a solute and solvent are always exothermic. And solute-solute breaking those is always endothermic. If those solute-solute bonds are very, very strong, very, very endothermic process, uh, it's going to take a lot of heat. We're going to see later. I'm going to find it. I'll just introduce you to this early. This is the ultimate equation for telling us if something will happen spontaneously or not. Uh, and so we're going to see that uh, delta G, again, I'm, I'm going ahead of what I wanted to, but it fits the question. Uh, if negative, will be spontaneous. Delta G uh, greater than zero will be non-spontaneous. So we're going to see that entropy and enthalpy both uh, have important roles to play in determining whether a process is going to be uh, spontaneous or not at a given temperature. So temperature, as we know, deals with the uh, motion of molecules. We're going to see a little bit later how that comes into play. But suffice it to say, if delta H is positive and delta S is negative, it will never happen. will never be spontaneous. That process will never happen no matter what temperature you have because you're going to end up with a positive number for delta G. Conversely, if you have delta H being negative and delta S being positive, that's always spontaneous at all temperatures. 
because you're always going to get a negative value for delta g. And then, however, if we've got the kind of other scenarios, delta h negative but delta s negative, it depends on temperature. Those ones we would like to do at, oh goodness, those are better at low temperatures. And the opposite one where they're both positive uh, also depends on T, those prefer high temperature. And so we're going to see things that are endothermic, of course. We prefer high temperature, right? Because that means we're going to push them towards the products anyway. And it's going to have to have enough temperature to overcome that entropy uh, problem. Uh, rather, to overcome the enthalpy to have a high temperature. This is the opposite process with uh, exothermic reactions that are negative delta S's. Uh, those you need at low temperature to make the delta S factor small. So um, this is something we'll cover, not today, but uh, that'll uh, show you why we can have uh, processes that are endothermic like dissolving us, uh, you know, something like dissolving lead to chloride would fit this last scenario where uh, dissolving the solids is better at high temperatures. So we see that lead uh, to chloride would be much more soluble in boiling water than it would be in cold water. Uh, and most solutes uh, do this process as well. So, alrighty. Quite a bit of a tangent there, but that's okay. I don't mind. Uh, let's uh, let's do another example. <laughs> now that we've gone all over the place, so let's do this. Uh, this is an example from your book. Let's see here. Uh, da -da 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 -da. So we have mercury. Uh, as a liquid, uh, freezes at, what's the temperature we have here? Negative 38.9 degrees Celsius. And delta H fusion is gonna be 2.29 kilojoules per mole. Uh, we can see uh, what's gonna happen. So last time we looked at one mole of water, but let's look at 50 grams of uh, mercury. And so again, we're going to just kind of assume infinitesimal temperature change, or we're going to fake it, um, which is okay. Uh, one thing to note here, are we expecting delta S to be positive or negative with this? Before we even do any sort of calculation. We're looking at something freezing, so that's liquid going to solid. Is liquid or solid <clears throat> more organized? Solid should be more organized, right? So this process should have a delta S that is going to be negative. We're expecting it to be less disordered once it's solidified. All right, when it's melting, it's the opposite. We're making things more chaotic. We have a positive delta S. For here, we have a negative one. We're expecting to have a negative one. So that should give us uh, some clue as to our uh, answer here. All righty, so uh, let's go ahead and do this. So we know that delta S is delta H over T for a process like this. We know that delta H for freezing will be negative 2.29 kilojoules per mole. 
we're going to have to do a few things first. We have a temperature in the wrong unit, and we have the ma uh, mass of mercury instead of the moles. I guess we have to convert this. Okay. And then we have the temperature in Celsius, so we'll have to fix that. So let's see, what, what's this uh, 50 grams of mercury going to be? Mercury's atomic mass, let's see. I've got it here, is 200.6. Let's just assume that that's 0.25. Good enough. All right, so we have 0.25 moles here. And we have a temperature, which was negative 38.9 plus 273. Kevin's already done the work for us. Should be negative though, Kevin. So if we plug that in, Kevin says that we get 2.43, uh, negative 2.43 joules per Kelvin, right? We're expecting it to be uh, negative because we're freezing. So remember, delta H fusion is positive for uh, melting and negative for freezing. Uh, it just depends which direction you go. And so... This would be our answer. So it should be negative for this process. Notice that delta S for 50 grams of mercury uh, melting would be positive 2.43 joules per Kelvin. So just like delta H, the sign uh, is going to be uh, the opposite for the opposite process. So delta S is a state function. So uh, just like delta H is. So remember, a state function just means that it doesn't matter what your process is. Uh, whatever you're doing to your, you know, components, they will all, uh, all that matters is point A to point B. It does not matter how you get there. So the difference, so just like, you know, distance, if we remember, if you're going from A to B, you could go this crazy distance traveled, or you could just go in a straight line, but the distance between those two is still the same. So path independent, does not matter how crazily you wiggle about, as long as you get from A to B, the distance between A to B is the same. And so that's the same with delta S. So just remember uh, state functions there. All right, that's a fun example. With its little Rooney. All righty, what's another one we can do? Da, 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 da. Um, now I think we've got some good examples there. So with that in mind, We're going to see that for a reversible process, remember that uh, we're going to have, just like with, with uh, Q or, or uh, delta H, we talk about things in terms of system or surroundings, right? So we're going to see that delta S uh, can kind of increase that's for the system or decrease, right? We can it can be positive or negative. I guess I guess it would not be delta. It would just be plain S. And we're going to see as a result the surroundings will also decrease or increase. Oh my gosh. What's Gumbo doing? Nobody knows. I miss Jersey. Okay, so let's say um, 
if we were to look at the ice melting or uh, this mercury melting or freezing at a different temperature, which can happen, you know, if we were to, uh, you know, eat the ice or whatever. And so we're going to see that we can calculate. Often we talk about delta S for the system, which is what we calculated with the ice or the mercury, but we can also calculate it for the surroundings. So let's say uh, we're going to take that energy, uh, put it into our bodies at 310 degrees Celsius, or Kelvin rather, not degrees, 37 degrees Celsius or 310 Kelvin. So if we take that uh, energy that we uh, saw that we needed to put into that ice to get it to melt uh, for the water, or sh shoot, let's just let's eat the mercury. Uh, so if we saw that the mercury, uh, you know what, let's just use the ice because I don't, oh, the, there's a delta H actually. So let's say we, we, <laughs> we eat some frozen mercury because we're really smart. If we eat the frozen mercury, remember that uh, delta S is the Q for a reversible process over the temperature, which we approximate as delta H for this process to be fusion over temperature. If we see what it's going to happen, uh, it was what, 2.29? So we're eating ice, mercury ice, so it's going to be positive. If you put that at 310 Kelvin, what's the answer going to be? I can do this before Kevin, maybe. 2.29 divided by 310. 7.39 joules per Kelvin. Positive, yeah? So notice that the entropy change for making this process happen at a higher temperature uh, is bigger, yeah? We saw that for the... For the uh, the change for the system was plus, oh, I'm sorry, it's negative because it's melting. But the change in the surroundings, if we were to eat that delicious mercury ice, is of course the opposite sign, but it's different magnitude. And we're going to see that if we add these up, this is always going to be greater than zero for an irreversible process. And this is known as the second law of thermodynamics. where the entropy uh, is always going to be increasing. And so we typically call uh, this value the change in the uh, S of the universe, the entropy of the universe. It's always increasing with every chemical process or physical process that happens. The entropy of the universe is always greater than zero when we look at these together. And so we can see just for this process, uh, that change is going to be positive, right? It should always be positive if you are adding to up your system and your surroundings. You should always get something greater than zero for an irreversible process. We saw that for If we're looking at a truly reversible process, no energy change, so no change of entropy either, no change of anything, uh, we're going to see that those will violate this law. So it says the law says that um, <clears throat> the technically it says that delta s universe 
is always greater than zero. That's what the second law tells us. <clears throat> and so, because a reversible process has delta S universe being equal to zero, we know that reversible processes Again, that means no energy change. They don't exist. There's always some energy lost as heat, some energy lost through friction or some, some other, you know, uh, factor in there. So heat, work, friction. Uh, I don't know, something else. <laughs> so uh, motion. Uh, there's always an energy change taking place. Uh, in every process uh, as a result. So we do not ever see reversible processes in reality. We only see irreversible ones. All right, so we have a lot of kind of broad concepts, I guess, here uh, in, in this section. We'll talk about entropy in a little bit more detail and kind of refine our definition of it uh, tomorrow uh, when we continue on with this. Uh, and uh, we'll be working on thermodynamics next week as well uh, before spring break. Woohoo! And so uh, it'll be exciting. So, any questions on this stuff so far? Suffice it to say, all we've done is look at delta S. <laughs> we could see we could calculate it from certain delta H uh, values and. Uh, at given temperatures, and we can uh, work with it that way. The whole point of this was just to show, by the way, that uh, the entropy of the universe is increasing always. All right. Cool. Uh, I guess I'll see you tomorrow then. We'll talk about entropy in more detail. We'll, we'll really kind of delve into it uh, in a much more um, thorough manner, I suppose. And then we'll start doing some more fun calculations. Alrighty, see you then.